Hello. Thank you for having me here at the B Corp Build Conference. I'm here to talk to you about redesigning your office environment, not just in response to COVID, but strategies that can also help you create a more equitable workplace. My name is Ellen Cruzy. I'm a licensed architect and an associate at Waterleaf Architecture. Waterleaf was founded in Portland in 1952 and has been serving the local area and the Pacific Northwest ever since. We became a B Corp in 2016, and our expertise lies in accessibility, sustainability, adaptive reuse, and new construction. We specialize in design for commercial, community, higher education, transit, winery, and residential projects. I'm going to start with an overview. Today I'll be talking about a brief history of building codes and standards. Then I'll talk about where we are today with the DEI movement. Then I'll discuss healthy buildings and how that relates to COVID-19. From there, I'll discuss specific strategies that you can use in your workplace. Then I'll talk about how to prioritize those improvements. Finally, I'll end with some additional resources that you can use. And if there's time, we'll have some Q&A. So development of building codes. The earliest cited building code is the Code of Hammurabi, and that was from 1758 BCE. In it, it said, if you build a house for someone and it collapses and kills them, then you'll be killed as punishment. Pretty harsh. Later on, catastrophic events such as the Great Fires of London triggered the development of regulations meant to prevent the spread of fire. As buildings became more dense and cities uh, grew taller, it became necessary to mandate things like light, ventilation, water supply. The first national building code was written in 1905 by the National Board of Fire Underwriters, which is an insurance company. They prioritized minimizing the risk to property damage, as well as human lives. Soon, various organizations and jurisdictions jumped in and started developing their own building codes. And it wasn't until the year 2000 that most of the United States adopted a single set of building codes, known as the International Building Code. These codes today address fire protection, occupant safety, accessibility, building construction, ventilation, plumbing, and energy efficiency. It's important to note that many jurisdictions still have their own unique modifications to this code. Now let's talk about the development of standard dimensions. Traditionally, the ideal or normal body type was male, white, heterosexual, cisgender, and able-bodied. All other humans were seen as exceptions to this rule. Many architects simply designed to their own proportions. Frank Lloyd Wright once told his students, I took the human being at five foot eight and one half inches tall, like myself, as the human scale. If I had been taller, the scale might have been different. Ideas like this led to exclusionary design. Covertly and overtly, anyone outside the dominant culture was excluded. From the segregation of non whites to separate entrances and separate rooms within buildings, to zoning laws and redlining, which actively discriminated against immigrants and people of color living in certain areas. And no accommodations were made for people with mobility devices or sensory impairments. It was only after decades of protest and the hard work of activists before legislation was passed that mandated accommodations and desegregation. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the American Disabilities Act of 1990. However, that wasn't the end of the struggle, which brings us to present day. We understand now that diversity is complex. There are many factors that make us unique, and some have a greater influence on how we're able to move through our lives. The tendency is to assume that people are like ourselves, but we must be intentional when it comes to listening and understanding what other want, others want and need. Here's some terminology you've probably heard before. Intersectionality. 
accumulative multiple forms of discrimination, such as when a person identifies with more than one marginalized demographic. Microaggressions, subtle and often unintentional expressions of prejudice, yet hurtful all the same. And trigger, to cause a negative emotional reaction, often related to past trauma. So let's look at this within the context of architecture. We must recognize how people perceive spaces and styles differently depending on their lived experience. For instance, side entrances for wheelchair users if looked at in the context of racial segregation. The emotions that a brutalist style building might trigger for a person with a history of imprisonment the symbolism of classical or colonial style architecture that conveys to those who have been historically oppressed by that dominant culture, or the difficulty faced by those whose gender identity does not fit the distinction made by gendered restrooms, not to mention for parents and caretakers who are of the opposite gender. Universal design. Now this is a design theory that seeks to address some of these concerns. Among its principles are equitability, flexibility, intuitive design, and accommodating spaces to the greatest extent for the most people. Now I'm gonna talk about healthy buildings. We all know what unhealthy buildings are. Obviously unhealthy things like black mold, lead poisoning, asbestos fibers are easy to see. But there's other things like access to daylight and ventilation temperatures that are outside of their comfort range, noise levels that are disruptive, and do your occupants feel safe? There are nine foundations of a healthy building. These uh, categories include air quality, thermal health, moisture, dust and pests, safety and security, water quality, noise, lighting and views, and ventilation. Considering Americans spend an average of 90% of our time indoors, it's important for our spaces to be healthy. And many of these categories directly relate to the transmission of COVID-19. COVID-19. So we have understood now that the primary transmission is through the air via large and small droplets. There are three main aspects of protection. The first of which is distance. The distance droplets can travel depends on a complex variety of factors, such as the velocity of the droplets and airflow patterns of the space. So the six foot rule is really the bare minimum and larger distances are better. Airflow, the more fresh outside air, the better, assuming the air quality is good. The direction of the airflow matters. You don't wanna be downwind of someone else's droplets. Studies have shown that COVID remains in the air longer when humidity is low, so a higher humidity is preferred. And the last thing is sanitation. Though studies have shown the risk to be very small, we can't completely rule out the risk of transmission from surfaces. And though laboratory studies have shown the virus to survive on surfaces for up to three days, in real world scenarios, it's unlikely to survive more than a few hours in concentrations that could get you sick. But that said, good hand washing and cleaning habits can't hurt and can help prevent the spread of other diseases. But avoid the overuse of harsh chemicals and hand sanitizers because they can have negative effects on people with sensitive respiratory systems. So now I'm gonna talk about some specific strategies that address not only the COVID concerns, but accessibility and equity in your workplace. I'm going to focus on design solutions rather than operational changes, though both work together for a holistic approach. Earning the trust of your staff to return to the workplace depends on offering a safe environment with amenities that cannot be replicated at home. Entrances, circulation spaces, and reception areas. Let's begin with a level entry or provide a ramp. Avoid relegating wheelchair users to a side entrance. Auto operator or push button doors can limit the transfer of germs and accommodate people with mobility challenges. 
make sure there's ample space for two wheelchairs to pass each other. And this can also accommodate social distancing. Toe kick elevator buttons are useful for wheelchair users, but also for people who have their hands full. If there are concerns about COVID transmission in elevators, see if your system can be programmed to limit the number of passengers at one time. Reception counter shields can serve multiple functions, preventing transmission of airborne particles, but also limiting noise, maintaining privacy, and an extra level of safety. If possible, locate restrooms near the entrance to facilitate hand washing upon entry and I'll cover more on restrooms later. Meeting areas. Social distancing concerns have us rethinking how we gather in our meeting spaces. Flexible and adjustable seating that not only allows for social distancing, but it can also accommodate people with mobility devices. Set up cameras and microphones to include telecommuters in those meetings. Make sure to install acoustic treatments at the same time to improve the ability to hear the conversation over the phone or through masks or for people with hearing loss. Enclosed meeting spaces can benefit from increased air exchanges, operable windows, or a UV light sanitizing system can be installed to cleanse the air. Outdoor meeting spaces, if an option, have the advantage of fresh air, daylight, and a connection to nature but be careful about ambient noise and light glare. The setup of workstations has a measurable effect on the satisfaction and productivity of staff. Sizing workstations to allow social distancing, providing dividers, or fully enclosing offices can decrease noise and improve privacy. But avoid the cubicle farm effect, where access to windows becomes limited. Access to those daylight and operable windows increases airflow, takes advantage of the disinfectant properties of sunlight, and improves occupant satisfaction and productivity. Make sure to arrange the workstation so that people aren't facing one another, and select flexible sit-stand workstations to accommodate various mobility and work styles. In open workspaces, increase that air in ventilation and filtration and monitor humidity levels. If you have an open work area, set aside an enclosed office or two that employees can use as quiet spaces. This can be handy as well if someone is immune compromised and needs an extra level of protection while they're in the office. Now let's address kitchen and break areas. To minimize the spread of germs, install touchless fixtures and touchless trash and recycling containers. Surfaces should be smooth and easy to clean. There are antimicrobial surfaces available as well. Place all flatware and dishes in enclosed cabinets at a level that can easily be reached. In fact, place all appliances if possible within accessible reach ranges. A dishwasher, if you don't already have one, is key to cleaning and sanitizing and can be easier for employees to use that have difficulty in grasping objects and might not be able to wash their dishes themselves. If space allows, separate hand washing and food preparation sinks. Consider whether or not to provide indoor dining areas. If you will have an indoor break area, position flexible seating arrangements to allow people to eat while socially distanced and to accommodate different needs. If possible, provide outdoor break areas. The last space I'm going to talk about is restrooms. The design of these spaces can have a great impact on sanitation and inclusiveness. Depending on the size of your office, you may have a couple of single user unisex restrooms or a larger restroom with individual compartments. By designing the larger restroom to be non-gendered, more people can use the available fixtures and reduce the likelihood of a line out the door. This type of restroom uses floor to ceiling toilet compartments with full size doors. This improves sanitation by separating the airspace and improves privacy. 
this is more equitable also for non-binary and transgendered people. Urinals can be placed in individual compartments or in a separate designated area. Space them out at least six feet or provide privacy screens. If space allows, eliminate the door into the restroom entirely. Instead, use a switchback entrance to block sight lines, similar to what you might see at the airport. Otherwise, use automatic door operators or tow poles. Just like in the kitchen, install touchless fixtures and use smooth, easy to clean and antimicrobial surfaces. Now I'm going to talk about a feature common to all the spaces I just mentioned, and that's colors, patterns, and textures. Colors are powerful. They not only set a mood, but they also influence our perception of a space. Light colors make a space seem bigger, and dark colors constrict a space. Color can be used for subtle wayfinding and to call attention to potential obstacles, such as changes in floor level. And in the era of COVID, color and patterns can help indicate proper social distancing spacing or highlight where the restrooms are located. But it's important to keep in mind that people with colorblindness or other vision impairments will not see color the same way. For them, distances in shade may be more noticeable than differences in hue. Therefore, a more monochrome palette with lighter and darker shades will be more effective. People that use American Sign Language communicate visually. So if you're looking to accommodate, it's best to use colors that contrast with skin tones, such as green, so that the signs are easier to distinguish. Some people become distracted by too much visual stimuli, so be thoughtful when selecting busy patterns and bright colors. So it might seem like the easiest solution is to simply paint everything white, but colors with high reflectivity, like bright white, contribute to eye fatigue. So it's best to defer to a more toned down neutral, such as a light gray. Similarly, texture has a lot to do with the success of a space. With COVID, the tendency is to choose smooth, easy to clean surfaces for anything that anyone might come into contact with. And in areas like restrooms and kitchens, that's certainly best. The problem is that all those hard surfaces reflect sound and contribute to a noisy work environment. So it's important to temper it all with acoustic treatments. Changes in texture can serve a similar purpose as changes in color, but in a tactile way that can be interpreted by people with vision impairment. For instance, a floor that transitions from a hard surface to a carpet implies a change in activity from high traffic to more sedentary. Color, pattern, and texture should be used carefully, keeping in mind the subtle and not so subtle messages they send. So that's a lot. Where to start? For new construction, certain accessibility accommodations are mandated by the building code. And for existing buildings and spaces, alterations to the space must comply with accessibility requirements to the extent feasible. A certain percentage, depending on the state you live in, must be spent on accessible upgrades. In Oregon, it's 25% of the construction budget. The code gives the following order of priority for improvements, and it's from the outside in. Begins with parking, then the entrance, then the route through the building, and finally the restrooms. Beyond this, the first thing to do is to engage your stakeholders. Your stakeholders are your staff, clients, neighbors, and whomever might interact with your workplace. This process can be done on your own or under the guidance of a professional. You might host a town hall meeting, bring together focus groups, or conduct a survey. Make sure you touch base and listen to feedback at various stages of the process and be transparent as possible about decision making. For more resources, you can visit the ada.gov for accessibility guidelines, Check out the Well Building Standard. If you've heard of LEED, it's like LEED for healthy buildings. 
The American Institute of Architects at AIA.org has issued recommendations to address COVID in various types of workspaces. Hire a DEI consultant to assist in recognizing barriers to equity and set goals for inclusion. And lastly, hire an architect to guide you through the design and permitting process. On behalf of myself and Waterleaf Architecture, I'd like to thank you in giving me the opportunity to talk about this subject. And if there's time now, I'll turn it over for Q&A. Thank you.